Amen. Great job, guys. Um, why don't we stand to our feet one more time, wake us all up again. Um, that was good. But why don't you lift your hands, Jordan, if you bring our lights up, uh, we're going to just pray blessing, ask the Holy Spirit to come and empower us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here. God, as we are your saints, your sons and daughters, we stand to our feet saying, this is how we thank the Lord this morning, that you've given us the Holy Spirit. So with hands lifted, we receive your Holy Spirit to empower us, to guide us, to lead us, to speak to us today. God, that we are not left alone, we are not left powerless, but you have, it says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. So Father, we thank you. And the best way we can thank you is in obedience, is in our surrender, is in our praise, our worship. We thank you, Father, that you give us this gift to give it back to you. So, Father, we thank you, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're going to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Well, we have a, um, a, a quick video I want you to see that's just going to introduce uh, the series. Uh, so, Caitlin, why don't you play this video real quick, uh, and then we'll jump into the book of 1 Corinthians. Well, hopefully that fires you up for the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, there is a lot that we are going to unpack in this series, and it's going to lead us all the way up into Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so we have about five weeks or so uh, that we're going to take, and then we're going to actually jump back into the book of Acts. If you remember last year, we, we finished up around Acts 13, and so we're going to jump back into the book of Acts to unpack the power of the Holy Spirit, how the church was built and get into uh, knowing our great, 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 great grandparents um, and how they started uh, the church and how they saw God do miracle after miracle after miracle. Uh, but what I love about the book of Acts or about the book of uh, Corinthians is uh, it actually starts in the book of Acts. And I don't know if you knew this, but he, uh, Paul has a missionary journey in Acts chapter 18 where we see him visit the church in Corinth. And what I love about 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is that these are letters in response to what he was hearing uh, going on in the church that he started and, and that he established. So if you go to Acts chapter 18, you'll see that he spent a year and a half in the church at Corinth. And as he was spending time there, as the church was planted, the church was growing uh, it would, uh, the church in Corinth would be known as a modern day Vegas. Uh, so they were dealing with every issue under the book. And these were uh, Jews converting into Christianity. These were Gentiles leaving paganism and, and secular thought, philosophies, and they were being transformed into Christianity. So Paul was a, a father, he was an apostle who was planting the church, building the church, uh, and then after a year and a half, he decides to leave, and he does two things. He, he sends them a letter, which we're about to read, and then he sends them a pastor whose name is Timothy. Um, so Paul, needless to say, had enough after uh, a year and a half, and so he sends a pastor and Timothy. Uh, and I, I always love in, when we get into this, the epistles, uh, especially in Timothy and Titus, because Timothy was a young pastor and had to deal with a lot of things that were above his pay grade and over his head. Uh, but he had one thing that made it uh, available and possible, and that was the Holy Spirit. And that was wisdom from Paul. 
And um, so I, I personally enjoy uh, my study time and reading through this. So it, it's greatly uh, ministered to me as I've read and prepared and studied. But I actually want to start in Acts chapter 18. And if, if you can be patient with me, we're going to go through things very quickly. And if you need notes in Scripture, we'll get them for you. But I'm going to go through uh, really a, a bird's eye view of it at 10,000 feet per se, as we look at 1 Corinthians. And so just to whet your appetite, to get your taste, um, and, and to get your head around the book, and then we're going to go kind of into the nitty-gritty in the weeks ahead as we tackle um, the issues and, and all of what Paul was getting into. Uh, but what I love about Paul is that uh, he was willing to keep his head in when it wasn't easy, when there was no instant reward, uh, when he didn't see things all come together or make sense. Paul was an excellent leader because he was willing to deal with dysfunction. You know, a lot of uh, the best leaders we see are willing to deal with dysfunction. And that's really what I want to title the message today because this is what Corinthians is all about, is dealing with dysfunction in the church. Um, can we all raise our hands and say, we are not perfect, church is not perfect, but we serve a perfect God, right? And so Corinthians, I believe, speaks to a, a culture today. It speaks to an attitude. It speaks to a even stronghold uh, that churches work through and deal with. And if you've been keeping up current in news and in culture, uh, there's this collapse of mega church taking place. You've maybe seen what's happening in, in Hillsong Church, all these wonderful churches, uh, but there's things coming out. There's attack against the church. There's institutional things that are taking place. And we could always go back. This is kind of my generation's unwinding, but there's stories we know that happened with great ministries and pastors in the 80s and the 90s, all of these things. And it kind of leaves you strong. It, it, as, a, as a congregate, as the lay faithful, as a church, a smaller church in our context and setting, it kind of shakes you when you see something that you've put trust and hope and faith in from leaders to churches. When you see things shake and when you see things crumble or when you see allegations come forth, it begins just to, to make you question everything. And can I trust? And, and what do I think about this? What does God's word say? And so the good thing we have with Corinthians is we would not have 1st and 2nd Corinthians if abuse wasn't happening in the church. And so Paul got very clear cut to say this is how we deal with it, and this is what God's Word says. Essentially, we're going to look at 10 things, but he takes 10 things specifically and says this is the gospel response to how you handle dysfunction and how you handle conflict. He's going to get into everything from um, uh, understanding spiritual leadership. He's going to touch things on unity. He's going to touch things on sexual immorality and sexual integrity. He's going to touch everything from having an eternal mindset. And without an internal mindset, you're not going to be able. It, Jesus and Christianity becomes just getting better in this life without any thought of the next. And we're going to see how, if we're not careful, the enemy wants to rob your eternal mindset on why we do what we do and why we build the kingdom and, and, and get out of this mindset that it's just to make things better in the here and now. But there's always something bigger at play, and we've got to protect that, and Paul will address these things. But I want us to see in, in uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 6, we see this specifically, and this is what Paul was dealing as he's in the church in Corinth. So this is him in the church in Corinth in the very beginning. And he's with Silas and he's with Timothy. Now, Paul early on was not full-time ministry, was not full-time preaching. Paul or Silas and Timothy uh, were tent makers along with Paul. And you'll even see uh, Priscilla, you'll see Aquila, who were a wonderful couple that helped and supported. Um, but Paul was a tent maker, and I love it because Paul is a blue-collar, rugged dude, right? But Paul is a guy we can respect because he wasn't just expecting handouts. He wasn't expecting all this support. Paul had his, his, his head in the game and was willing to do whatever and whenever 
to support himself, to support the ministry. And as God began to bless and do, uh, he would then delegate the tent building, uh, history teaches us, to Timothy and to Silas so that Paul could focus on everything uh, that was taking place and happening. So we even see kind of Paul's early years in ministry here of, of what was happening and how he got his support and how he was able to accomplish so much of what we read in the New Testament. And so we see it in verse 6. This is, this is what he was dealing with. It said, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. You read before then is that he was dealing with going into the synagogue, reasoning with all the philosophers, with all the Gentiles, and trying to convince uh, the Jews and the Gentiles that he is the Christ, he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And Paul was getting worn out and done with, with that rhythm and that routine. So he says, I am done being opposed by you. I'm moving on. You know, when we say that, we get ourselves in trouble. Look what happens next. Uh, then the Holy Spirit gets involved. And it says that Paul has a vision in Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Look what it says. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid. And I want this to be for somebody here today. I think just as the Holy Spirit spoke this to Paul, he can speak. He's speaking this to us. And whatever mountain you're trying to overcome, circumstance you're in, this is, this is good when you feel like you want to quit and you're dealing with disappointment, frustration, dysfunction. It says, do not be afraid, but, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Look what it says. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So we got revelation from God, spoke to him in a vision, and he continued to teach and do what God told him to do. And so this is where we see the church in Corinth established for a year and six months. So now let's flip over to 1 Corinthians. So that's kind of the snippet we get in the book of Acts. And then um, about a couple years later, 18 months to a couple years, then the letter comes saying, Paul, you've left. Now here's what's happening and going on. Quite honestly, this is a leader's nightmare that you leave it thinking it's in good condition and it's good shape, and then you get... 10 areas of dysfunction that the church is dealing with. And so Paul sends a response back to them and says, okay, this is what's happened. Here's what the gospel says, and here's how you're to deal with it in the context of community and, and how leadership is to deal in their role and just gives excellent insight. And I think as we see all this shaking happening in the church or maybe shaking in your life, where's the first place we should go? to the Word of God, that that's where we get wisdom to how to deal with life issues, with how to deal with church issues, with how to deal with issues in your business, issues in your family, dysfunction, wherever it may be. It's found clearly and distinctly in God's Word. And so 10 dysfunctions. Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Um, I know you came to church today to hear about dysfunction, so thank you. But it's good, and we've got to talk about this stuff to set it, set it up, and this is, this is God's word. Uh, but number one is that they dealt with dis divisions around personalities. Divisions around personalities. It says this in, in 1 Corinthians 1.12. It says that, that that is that I may be encouraged together with you by mutual faith, both you and me or sorry, I'm in Romans. I need to flip over one more. Uh, but it says this, it says, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am Christ. Cephas is Peter. Um, so what we see here is that there's this division in Cor Corinthian, in the Corinthian church in Corinth, that some will say, well, I really love Paul's boldness. I love his approach, that I am all for Paul. And then you see, well, Apollos, he is a charismatic, gifted speaker. And did you hear the miracle that happened in his meeting? Come on, let's all run over to Apollos and to his service. And then you'll see, no, well, Peter's the rock of the church. He, he built the church. 
started the church. He was a direct apostle. He was a disciple. And so there's all this tug of war happening of who wants to follow who, who likes that one's theology, all of this, what we see and deal with in really the evangelical church today, right? That there's a division of personality, that we go by who we like, how it's communicated, um, and really how shallow, I'm putting myself in this, that we can all be, where Paul is saying, can we put all of that aside? Because we're all preaching the same Christ. We're all preaching Jesus. Now there's differences in there in theology, and and to be a good Berean, like it says in Acts, know the scripture, know the word. Um, you should test what is preached against the word of God. But what it's saying here is Paul is saying, all of you, can't you come together? Use your gift to encourage and build the church instead of cause division in that community. So Paul is, is speaking to this on the petty division around personality. He also says this in 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 4, it comes up again. Um, but it says that you are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of the world? So it's saying, if you can't get this right, then there's going to be no distinction between how you deal with things from how the world deals with things that we should value unity and work and strive toward unity, Paul is, is addressing. Second one, so there's division among personalities. Second is spiritual pride. You know, the church in Corinth thought that they were quite something and weren't afraid to boast it, to talk about it, um, that they thought that, you know, they were the bee's knees, right? That they had it going on, that they had the vibe, they had everything that you could want, they had. And in that, when you get in a place of spiritual pride, you always lose touch with reality because you, you tend to then look down on people. You look down on situations. Instead of stretching your hand down, you turn from that and you keep yourself built up and you keep yourself insulated. Um, so they lost sense of, of reality. 1 Corinthians 4.7 gives you insight into what they were feeling and thinking. It says, for what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it's not a gift? So Paul is saying here, why are you boasting in this? Because this is a gift that God has given you. This is a gift of how this church has been built and established. And he's saying that this was given to you. And think about it for a minute. Why boast in a gift? Look what we did. Look what I did, where it's like, no, 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 look what God has given you. That's where the boasting should be in the gift that's been received, not taking ownership and closing in on it, saying, look what I've done, and taking credit for what God has done. So there's spiritual pride. Number three, there's a distrust of leaders. And I want you just to see this as we kind of piece all of these things together and, and see where these, these come in. You heard this in Acts 18, but there was such opposition and, and, and Paul really dealing with such um, complaint and uh, dealing with whining, dealing with uh, emotion, dealing with all the, the things in people when they want to give their opinion, dealing with all of the Facebook posts, dealing with the social media, all of the stuff. Paul is, is having enough of it. And he's saying that there is such a distrust. Why am I here if you don't trust anything that I'm saying? And so he, he sets the record straight. Is you've got to trust somebody somewhere at some point. And so look what it says. It says, um, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, it says, So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ. So he's saying, you've got to view and see that your spiritual leaders are servants and are here to serve. And so he's saying, you have to see us as servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. In verse 2, it says, now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. So it's giving criteria. Is If you're a leader, then you have to exemplify some of these qualities, if not all of them. It says, as for me, it matters very little, little how I might be evaluated by you. 
So he's saying, I don't care what you think. I'm here on mission from God, and I know that I have to give account to him. So he's saying, I don't care how you are evaluating me or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. He says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. And here's where we hear really some sobering truth as we even stand before Jesus at the judgment seat. He says, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring the darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. And so we hear that, that our motives, as dark as they may be or as right as they may be, will re be revealed um, at the judgment seat of Christ. And, and that sobers me because when I think of because you, you can hide motives pretty well, right? You can, you can disguise motives. You can do the right thing, but your motive is wrong. And this is what the gospel always does. It always cuts straight to the heart, not what you just do with your hands. It deals with your head and your heart as well, not just what the Pharisee does with their hands or what the law says you do with your hands, but it, it goes to the heart and it goes to your mind, that it, it cares that deeply. And so that there's a judging that will take place. And Paul is saying, you've got to trust me because this is, this is the mantle or this is the anointing that I'm under, that I know every motive will be judged, and this is the level of spiritual leadership that I'm understanding. I'm not going to lead you astray because I have to answer to him. So he, he's trying to set the foundation here to bring trust and to bring respect. So there's a distrust of, of his leadership and leadership in general that Paul is addressing in the Corinthian church. And when you read these things, it sounds like, again, the church today, the dysfunction that is kind of a revolving door that somewhere along the line is dealt with and is worked through. And he's calling them to a deeper place of, of maturity. Number four is a failure to exercise church discipline. Now, this is, this is a scary part of Corinthians when you get into it. Um, but there's, he's talking of the leadership that he left behind before he sent Timothy, that they were uh, weary of conflict and criticism. And this is really when you're a leader, and I'm just speaking from experience, when you know you have to address something and you know conflict and criticism is going to come from it, you try to pray through it, you try to work through it, you try to think through it. Maybe you're a manager, you're a boss, and you know when you have to confront someone, you're literally praying in tongues on the way to the office, you're doing everything you know you need to do because as well as you say it, as good as you say it, with as big of a smile on your face as you say it, you know that there's going to be a conflict and there's going to be criticism on the other side of it. Um, but that's no excuse. When God entrusts you over people, there is a right way to deal with conflict and a right way to deal with criticism. So he's addressing these things because the, th the, the level of dysfunction that they were allowing to happen underneath their care and their leadership is paramount and is, is, is to the point of disgust of what the leadership um, was allowing to take place. Uh, it can even be said this way, that there was a chronic case of persistent sin in the church and that they prided themselves in tolerance. So they, they valued tolerance at such a level where it got to the place of everyone just kind of do what you want, then we'll gather together, we'll worship, and then you go back and you just do whatever you want. No repentance, no addressing sin. And then the leadership were the, the ones leading, um, you know, leading the train on this thing. And so you get in and you can really read this. 1 Corinthians 5 speaks a lot to it. And... Uh, this is where uh, sexual integrity is, is spoken of, but it says, I can hardly, Paul says, he opens it up, I can hardly believe. So he's saying, is this really what I'm get, um, is coming back to me in this letter? He says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. So he's saying, it's so debased that it's something that the world doesn't even do, and it's happening in the church of Jesus. So he can't believe this. And he gives the example. 
He says that I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourself, but you should be mourning in sorrow and in shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. So he's getting into the nitty-gritty details. Is how are you allowing these things to take place in your fellowship and in your church? And he's speaking right to it as this is what you practically need to do here. And we'll take a week and we'll, we'll speak to what's happening in 1 Corinthians 5. Um, but you can go and read it and, and, and see what Paul gets into there. So it's, it's a failure to exercise church discipline. And there's, there's kind of the, the, the high level of what they were dealing with. Uh, number five is there's a threat of lawsuits. A threat of lawsuits taking place in the church. Everybody is suing everybody in the church because of their issues. No one's coming to agreements. No one's working through things. It's when they have an issue, open a lawsuit. And again, Paul is saying, that's what the world does. That's what pagans do. Here's how we get to a place of understanding to work through conflict, to not where everybody is running and getting a lawyer and threatening lawsuits at every, at every way can bend. Look what uh, Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 6 gives a punch list of what they're dealing with. Um, but I want you to see specifically 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7. Um, it says that even to have such lawsuits with, with one another is a defeat for you. So it's saying you think you're going to win because the injustice has been done. But in building the big picture of the kingdom, you're already defeated. It says, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Now, there's certain times and places that you have to take legal matters, yes. But the pettiness of the lawsuits that were taking place is what Paul is addressing. Oh, somebody went in your home, or, okay, breaking and entering, let's not use that example. Uh, somebody, somebody looked at you a certain way in your fellowship and gave you a dirty look, and then you just got a conspiracy about you, and you thought you're missing something in a bag that you brought with you, and you just know it was them because the way they looked at you. So you falsely accuse them and you open a lawsuit against. This is just the kind of stuff you can imagine that was taking place. And so he said, why not just let yourself be cheated? You know, it's, it's okay to, to let this one go. In verse eight, instead you yourself are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. So they're, they're hypocritical even. Uh, one's being sued and that same person that's being sued is suing somebody else. Uh, so Paul's saying it's not the end of the world if you're wrong here. You can, you can swallow this one. Number six, so we have lawsuits, then we have, um, and doesn't this sound like our world, is there's discontentment of unmarried and singles. So you have marriages um, in the church, and they're discontent, and they start getting a wondering eye, and they're looking at other people they're in fellowship with and saying, wow, the grass looks a little greener over there and I'm discontent, and instead of watering my own marriage, maybe I go over here and, and water the grass over there. Maybe there's something better. That sure looks a lot better. And this is, again, happening in the church. This isn't the world. This is the church. And so you see the discontentment, but he just doesn't stop there. He then addressed the singles in the community that are, are in sexual immorality and addressing the parameters of of sexual integrity as well. And so 2 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2, and this is to give you a taste. It says, now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, again, this is a reply from Paul. Yes, it is good to abstain from these relations, but because there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. So you see how um, basic Paul has to bring it? I'm going to spell it out so there's no, there's no misunderstandings here. This is the word of God, and this is how it's supposed to be. And so he writes about singleness. He writes about marriage. He writes about divorce. He writes about the widow remarrying, all of these things, and gets to the heart of the issue. So we'll, we'll take a week, and, and we'll get into marriage and what Paul um, is talking about as well. I like this. Married people who wanted to be single, and single people who wanted to be married. That's point blank what Paul is, is dealing with. 
Number seven is this, so there's discontentment of the unmarried and singles. Number seven is there's confusion on Christian freedom. So he takes a better part of Corinthians and addresses everything from what you eat, what you're wearing, all of these things to try to say, no, you're, you're being more of a Pharisee here. And no, you're over here. You're more in a, in, a, in a space of rebellion. And he tries to bring them to the middle of, of what is accepted and what is pleasing to God. Not what is, is religious and not what is rebellious, but what stays in the place of repentance. Now, you, could, you can see many denominations, many churches. This is usually where they focus on of what the extremities of things, of how it's supposed to be in order for you to belong and for you to be a part. So Paul gets into all of this and addresses these things from alcohol to food to what you're wearing to um, who's ministering, how to minister, all of these things that are needed to set a, a good um, foundation. So he addresses this confusion and he brings clarity. 1 Corinthians 10 is where it's found. It says that these things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. So this was the heart is get the cravings of idolatry out of your life. That you've, you've got to replace these cravings with conviction. So it says in verse 7 um, that you're worshiping idols as some of them did. But Scripture says the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in, in pagan ways. And it says when we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing it tells of a story of 23,000 of them to die in one day. So he brings confusion, or he brings clarity to a lot of confusion. And I would say a lot of us um, kind of park and camp in a lot of confusion on these issues. So as we open God's word and we take a week and, and we investigate this, that my heart and my prayer is that clarity would come forth and you would know what God's word says that, so that you can thrive, you can teach your children to thrive, <laughs> that you can have fidelity in your life, that you can be who God has called you to be, and it only comes by knowing his word, knowing his spirit, being around the people of God, us encouraging each other, and, and making this a reality. Number eight is this, there's tension around worship, of how we're to worship, how we're to gather, what's acceptable, not acceptable. You know, we know, all of us know 1 Corinthians 13. Right? It was read at a lot of your weddings. It's the love chapter. Um, I found this interesting, and I didn't connect the two right away. But 1 Corinthians 13 is not specifically about love in your marriage. Um, it's more geared toward love in Christian community, of how we're to love one another and forgive one another. Uh, but we usually take it and we read it in, in our marriages, and it's a vow, and, and it, it still is applicable, but the context of when it's, it's given is in how we're to love each other and work through things as we worship, as we gather, as we're in community together. Um, but it, it gives us, because there begin to be an abuse of, of spiritual gifts. There begin to, the, the Holy Spirit would, would show up and then things would happen and there would be an abuse. So Paul says, okay, this is, this is really what it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be um, served and manifested to be a blessing to the body, not to cause distraction, not to be a scarecrow, not to turn people away from the Holy Spirit, but to serve people the Spirit. And so this is what it says in, in 1 Corinthians 12. It says that there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. So it's bringing unity of how the gifts of the Spirit work. Number nine, so we have tension on worship. Number nine is, an, is a loss of eternal perspective. There begin to become heresies on the resurrection of the dead, that will we have a resurrected body? What does that look like? Are we, are we going, what does eternity look like? So Paul takes the better part of 1 Corinthians 15, and he preaches the gospel, that this is the tenets of the gospel. This is the resurrection of the dead. And uh, it says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 12, that being a Christian would be only, or sorry, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? Um, and maybe you didn't know this, but 
when you die and the resurrection of the dead happens, there will be a moment in history where we will get our bodies back and there will be a resurrection of our body. Just as Jesus had a resurrected body, we will have a resurrected body. And look, this is just fun to do when you look at what Jesus did in his resurrected body. He walked through walls. He showed up in different points of time and didn't have to walk there. I mean, this is like amazing stuff of what Jesus did in his resurrected body. So if you want to have a little fun with the scripture, uh, read when Jesus appeared in his resurrected body. and Maybe it's an indication of what we can do in our resurrected body, okay? Um, but there, there's a lot to unpack there as well. Um, and number 10, he deals with their generosity so that they were reluctant in giving and in being generous. Um, and he, he, he sends Timothy, he sends um, scripture. And this is what's neat is Paul is, is writing this letter and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In that moment, it is becoming scripture that is infallible, that is becoming the word of God. So when you think about that, I, I bet Paul didn't even know the reality of what was taking place that uh, the one day that it would become canon and that what he wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit would then guide billions of Christians that would come after him, how we would worship, how we would gather, how we would build the church, preach the gospel. Um, and so it's, it's quite amazing when you just take a step back and see what the Holy Spirit was doing in this uh, reply to the church in Corinth. And when I read it and see it, I think we can put our head around it because the issues he's addressing is the issues we would deal with in 2022. 2,000 some years later, um, it would be so relevant of how we're to, to operate and to deal with these things and to see his church be radiant and bright, not cause hurt, pain, and dysfunction. And so uh, we see the re reluctant giving. 1 Corinthians 16, um, 1 through 4. If you have it back there, it says this. It says, now concerning the collection for the saints. Come on, that's a good pastor who knows how to word it's time for the offering in a very nice way. The collection of the saints. And he says, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I do come, whoever, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if, it was, but if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So it's to support the missionary journeys, the advancement of the church, the building of the church, taking care of widows and orphans. Um, he goes on to, to lay all of that out and not being reluctant in generosity. And so I want to end with this. Um, you know, he sent Timothy, and, and, and we see this, that Timothy comes. If you read the opening of 1 Corinthians, he's speaking of Timothy. You then get into 2 Corinthians, and that's a whole other letter. Um, because Timothy, uh, as he was sent in to pastor this community, is, um, he struggled. Now, Timothy's coming off of an amazing missionary journey in, in the church of Thessalonica, we get the book of Thessalonians from it. So Timothy was killing it as a pastor. The church was growing. It was thriving. It was honoring God. Uh, and then Paul sees, okay, you can handle Thessalonica. You can handle this church. Well, I have another journey for, uh, assignment for you. I'm going to send you to Corinth, and let's see uh, how good you do there. Paul's just going to send a letter. He's going to leave it at that, but then he's going to make Timothy um, do the hard work. Uh, so we see that Timothy is sent, and, you know, there's this window you get into Timothy being there is that he deals with failure um, in how he kind of pastored and dealt with uh, the issues that he had to deal with. And you can kind of see this in, in Paul's language. It says in um, 1 Corinthians 16, 10 through 11. Look what it says, and it says, and if Timothy comes. So we know that he was going, but Paul's like, if he even makes it, if he's even able to, to get there. Um, and this is just kind of light at heart. He says, see that he may be with you without fear, 
So Paul knew what he was going into, and he's encouraging them, please receive them, don't buck him like you did me, um, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brothers. So he's saying, take care of Timothy when he comes, if he comes. We know he did go. Um, so Paul knew what he was sending him into. But as he comes back, and it, as, you, as you open the next letter in 2 Corinthians, as you get into it, you'll see that Titus is mentioned, that Timothy is no longer on the front lines doing the work because of the defeat, the disappointment, maybe the failure. Um, and what I want to speak to you today is if you feel like you are dealing with dysfunction, it says in 2 Corinthians that you see this we, and you see Timothy by Paul, who is, is helping him formulate and write 2 Corinthians. And as you get into 2 Corinthians, you'll see that he would then again get sent to the church in Ephesus and would do amazing things there. So Timothy did not park in his defeat. He did not park in his disappointment. He knew where he needed to heal. He knew where he needed to say, I was just on the front lines of all this dysfunction, so now I need to come to the place and sit with Paul, get some more wisdom. It's Titus's turn. See you, buddy. Um, and uh, let him deal with some suffering and share in that. But when you see how the church started, how it was built, it had its dysfunction. And Jesus never promises a church that would be clear of dysfunction. He never promises that you wouldn't get a church hurt. He never promises that you wouldn't have to work through some things. But what he does say is that there is comfort available to you. We read this, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Let's read it again. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can picture Timothy filling in Paul of this is what I went through. And so this is Paul's response is that the church needs a little bit of comfort. He says, blessed be the God and Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Three things I see is one, you gotta stand firm in your calling when you're dealing with tribulation, when you're trying to bring change, when you're wanting to see dysfunction in your home leave and, and see your kids um, get a breakthrough in an area of their life, you gotta stand firm and not back away, not back up. Timothy stood firm in his role but Paul knew when it was time to pull him out and to send Titus. Number two is you've got to grow in character. Think about the hardest seasons and moments of your life. Those are when you should be growing the most. This is how God uses suffering and pain in trial as he grows our character. We usually don't grow when it's easy, everything's working. We grow when things are tough. When you're having to pick your kids up who want to come into your room, but you got to take them back into bed with the fear that they're going to wake up your daughter uh, because they're going to be crying on the way there, right? There's a tribulation I've been working through. Um, and knowing that I'm probably going to lose some sleep, I'm going to suffer a little bit the next day because I'm trying to bring peace and stability in this situation and not allow things to get dysfunctional. Where well, I have two kids and a dog in bed with us every night. I'm growing in character. So you've got to stand firm. You've got to grow in character. And like we said, number three, you've got to receive the comfort of God. You've got to receive it. If you stand this morning, I want to pray. And I want us to simply do that. That whatever dysfunction you're dealing with, deal with it head on. And know that the Spirit of God will empower you that there's comfort for you, and that continue to stand firm in your vocation and your calling, as tough as it may seem. If you lift your hands.
Jesus, we thank you that in our weakness we are made strong. That Timothy had to come to the end of himself. Paul had to come to the end of himself and trust in something that only God could do. Those areas in sin and addiction and dysfunction in our life, that breakthrough only comes when we, when we drop to our knees and we say, God, this is only something you could do. So, Father, we just want to put our trust in you. We want to surrender to you. God, that we don't want to raise dysfunctional kids. We don't want to have dysfunctional marriages. We don't want to be dysfunctional in our generosity. We don't want a dysfunctional church. Father, we don't want to be dysfunctional in what we eat and what we wear, what we drink. Father, we don't want to be dysfunctional in how we honor and respect leadership. Father, if we are a leader and a manager, if we're over someone, we don't want to be dysfunctional in how we serve them. Father, we know that we can't deal with what we don't define. So, Father, I pray that your grace come so gently this week and begin to define some dysfunction that we need to deal with. And, Father, as we deal with it, we'll see the power of God. We'll see your strength. We'll see your word guide us and lead us. Father, we stand firm. We trust in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you are in this place, you are in this house. Touch every heart, every mind, and every hand. That curses stop with us. That poor choices stop with us. God, that we raise the standard that we lean into the Holy Spirit just as Paul and Timothy had to do. Lead us, Holy Spirit, in this endeavor. We thank you for this letter. We thank you for Paul's testimony that it can become a part of our testimony as he was inspired of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said...